Warning, the following is a review of The Unwritten, a mature reader's comic published by DC's Vertigo imprint. Although there is no nudity in this story, there is still foul language, graphic violence including violence depicted against children, as well as fascistic and anti-Semitic imagery. Viewer discretion is advised. Previously on The Unwritten, author Wilson Taylor used his son Tommy as the central character in a series of young adult fantasy novels. Since Wilson's mysterious disappearance, Tommy, now going by Tom, makes a living off the convention and book signing circuits. All of this falls apart when a young reporter named Lizzie Hexham confronts Tom with evidence that he's not really Wilson Taylor's son, possibly being purchased on the black market or having never really existed at all. This leads to Tom Taylor being called a fraud by the public and assaulted at every turn. Tom attempts to locate Lizzie Hexham, only to discover that she also doesn't seem to exist, as Lizzie Hexham is a character from the Charles Dickens novel, Our Mutual Friend. When confronted, the reporter, who we'll just call Lizzie at this point, reveals that Wilson Taylor is still alive, and went into deep hiding after angering the wrong kind of people. Yes, it turns out that there is a secret cabal of people who have used literary figures such as Rudyard Kipling and Mark Twain to manipulate world politics. Kipling, in fact, broke away from the group shortly before World War I started, which in turn led to the death of his son. He tried to warn the world in a largely unnoticed manuscript that just happened to come into possession of Wilson Taylor in the early 1970s. Not wanting Tom to find out anything further, the Cabal dispatches an immortal hitman named Pullman to kill Tom and anyone involved with him. Knowing this, Lizzie takes Tom to the villa on Lake Geneva where Mary Shelley first wrote Frankenstein, which is hosting a small convention of writers who have gathered to try to put their own spin on the story. Searching the villa turns up two unique artifacts, a magical shape-shifting map of Europe and the doorknob the literary Tommy Taylor uses for interdimensional travel. This is all interrupted by the arrival of Pullman, who begins slaughtering the other horror writers at the villa. Tom sends Lizzie away with the map and doorknob and attempts to confront Pullman. However, the hired killer vanishes just as the police arrive and arrest Tom. We continue the story of Tom Taylor as it takes a turn into history with figures like Charlemagne and members of the Third Reich. This is The Unwritten Volume 2. Inside Man. Social media flips out as the news of Tommy's supposed actions at the villa hits. Tom is brought for arraignment by the Swiss court, only for a wrinkle to be thrown as the French government has asked for the case to be transferred to them. As it turns out, one of the victims, housekeeper Matilda Venner, was French. Wanting to avoid the immediate circus, the judge gladly approves the extradition. On the train to France, another prisoner named Richard Savoy tries buttering Tom up for information. All the while, the train is followed by a large shadowy figure. Tom and Savoy arrive at the prison, Maison d'Aret de Rancevo, where the two are put amongst the general population due to a women's wing being added to the place. Meanwhile, back in Geneva, Lizzie Hexham goes into a bookstore, amusing to herself as she flips open a book to find a series of messages telling her to get to France to rescue Tommy out of prison. Unfortunately, there's really only one day to do that, so Lizzie goes into the police building, claiming to have information on the Tom Taylor case, and drops a bunch of weapons on the floor. Which causes her to send to be prison in France for some reason. Back at the prison, Tom endures the taunts from the other prisoners as he slowly pieces together that he's in Roncevaux Pass, which is where the Song of Roland took place. The Song of Roland is an epic poem depicting a battle between the forces of Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire and Muslim forces from Spain. Roland was Charlemagne's nephew and leader of the rear guard, who was tricked by his father Ganelon into entering Roswell Pass, where the Muslim forces subsequently jumped and massacred them. Tom explains that the poem is effectively a propaganda piece. The events were real, but maybe didn't play out as depicted in the song. However, the song's popularity has grown so much that now it's taken as gospel. As Lights Out arrives, the mysterious tattoo on Tommy's hand begins glowing again. Tom awakens that night to find his cell door open and he goes through it and makes his way to the prison chapel. There he finds the Frankenstein's monster, as well as the literary pet of Tommy Taylor, a winged feline named Mingus. The creature claims that Tom has been calling out to him since the villa, which is something our hero can't remember doing. He promises to return when Tommy realizes the truth. On his way back to his cell, Tom gets jumped by the guards. They say that this is a paid hit, and it's only through Savoy's intervention that Tom isn't killed. Unfortunately, a guard winds up getting killed when Mingus tackles him over a railing. 
The two are brought before the prison warden, Claude Chadron, who berates both men for insinuating that the guards are on the take. He's especially angry with Tom, as he's viewed as a hero by children, in particular Chadron's own children, Cosette and Leon. He winds up sending the two to solitary confinement. As this plays out, Lizzie is brought to the new women's wing of the prison, along with the map and doorknob still being in her possession. In solitary, Savoy reveals the truth. He's a blogger who bought his way into prison to have exclusive coverage of Tommy Taylor. Tom stays silent for the next few hours until Savoy starts looking up information on the Song of Roland, and Tom once more points out its nature as propaganda, only to suddenly be interrupted by the sight of Roland holding his Oliphant to his lips, which Savoy is also able to see. An Oliphant is a horn made from a hollow-out elephant's tusk. In the Song of Roland, Roland uses his Oliphant with his last bit of strength to blow on it and summon the forces of Charlemagne to come back and avenge the massacre. That night, Chadron finishes reading another Tommy Taylor novel where he squares off with his erstwhile nemesis, Count Ambrosio, to his children. He then gets a call from a man named Skate, who it turns out is with the Cabal. The first attempt to take Tom Taylor out has failed, so now Chadron has had to call him back up. However, Chadron is surprised when he's greeted by a military-level force at the prison gate. This is too much, as only Thomas Savoy are the ones to die, no one else. However, before he can do anything, Chadron is knocked out by the butt of a gun. So what exactly is the story with Warden Claude Chadron? Well, he's new at the prison, and because of the construction of the new women's facility, he and his family, consisting of wife Adia and children Cassette and Leon, have to live on a house located on the prison grounds. Also, Cosette and Leon, or Cosi as she is commonly known, are big fans of the Tommy Taylor series, and Claude spends every night reading the books to the children before they go to bed. Unfortunately, it began to appear that the stress of the move made Cosi dive deeper into the Tommy Taylor lore to the point in she and the still impressionable Leon began chanting spells wherever they went. When Adia began voicing concern, Claude just chalked it all up to the kids having their imaginations running wild. This all came to a head when Cosi was confronted with news of the real Tom Taylor's arrest by a boy at school and she attempted to gouge the boy's eye out. Though Cosi was ordered to go to therapy, Claude steadfastly maintained that this was just overactive imagination. Because kids love gouging each other's eyes out, am I right? Still, Claude knew that having Tom at the prison wasn't good and wouldn't allow for possibly any mental healing to take place with Cosi. So it's then he began making arrangements, first with guards, and when that failed, the cabal. Returning to the present, the two Shadron children are snapped out of bed by the commotion from the prison. Cosi knows that Tommy is in trouble and that she and Leon are the only ones that can help him. Only good can possibly come of this. Back at the prison, the Cabal's forces begin making their way through, killing everyone. Many of the prisoners begin fighting back, and back in solitary, Tom and Savoy try to figure out what the hell is going on when Mingus arrives with a note from Lizzie. It's then that Shadron comes to, and he's greeted by the visage of Roland lifting his Oliphant as he rings the alarm to set all of the prisoners free. Tom and Savoy then make their way to the prison holding area so that they can come into possession of the map and doorknob, which they then use to reunite with Lizzie. Unfortunately, Tom was not aware that Cosi and Leon were following them, and they are now in possession of the doorknob. Their pursuit of the two children is interrupted when a sniper spots them and shoots out Savoy's phone. The Shadron children manage to bump into their father, however, his actions make them believe that he's under an enchantment from Count Ambrosio, and they break away. It's then that one of the armed forces shoots a rocket launcher, which hits a nearby wall, toppling it down on both of the children. Everyone is taken aback as Shadron makes a desperately futile search for Cosi and Leon. Lizzie grabs the doorknob and talks Tom into using it, which he reluctantly does. Shadron attempts to give chase, only to step on an exposed wire and get electrocuted. Later, when one of the Cabal's forces come across the now hairless Shadron, the Warden leaps up and rips out the soldier's throat with his mouth. Shadron proclaims that he's the new vampiric host of Count Ambrosio, and that he will kill Tommy Taylor. Wonderful. Just wonderful. Tom, Lizzie, and Savoy find themselves in Nazi Germany. Tom immediately tries to open a new door, only for the walls to appear illusory. In fact, a small band of German troops then pass through with no mention. Lizzie pieces together that they're in Stuttgart and it's 1940. Tom demands to know what the hell is exactly going on and begins hounding Lizzie, and she holds up the map. The coordinates for Stuttgart appear on the map, as well as a note reading, Jud sus, too late to save? Tom threatens to torch the map, and Lizzie confesses that Wilson Taylor is behind everything, that he created Tom and Lizzie to do his will. So, Wilson Taylor is also Charles Dickens? Distraught, Lizzie runs off, leaving Tom and Savoy to wander around aimlessly. It's then that Tom notices Pullman coming out of the Ministry of Information office. The two opt to look inside to see what the hell the killer was up to, and it's there they see Joseph Goebbels screening a film, Jude Seuss. Jude Seuss, or Suss the Jew, was a propaganda film produced by the Nazis during World War II. 
It took a lot from a novel written by Lion Feuchtwanger about a Jew named Joseph Oppenheimer who served Duke Karl Alexander of Württemberg. Oppenheimer was eventually accused of the Duke's murder and held steadfast, even refusing to convert to Christianity even before being executed. The funny thing is, is that Feuchtwanger was in fact a Jew who wrote the novel from Oppenheimer's perspective. Obviously, the Nazis weren't going to do anything like that, and so they turned it into a Nazi propaganda film, turning Oppenheimer into the ultimate villain. Meanwhile, Lizzie makes her way to a bookstore and begins calling out for Wilson Taylor. Since she can't put her hands on any of the merchandise, he begins communicating to her through the radio and demands to know where they are and what they're doing. Back in the propaganda screening, Goebbels clears the room and begins talking with Thomas Savoy, who he can both see. He begins to look fuller in appearance, which leads Tom to conclude that their non-canonical presence is affecting things in this realm. This is indeed true, and it's the last thing Wilson Taylor wants, as it turns out the more you focus on something, the more real it becomes in this world. Goebbels reveals that he's in league with the Cabal, with Pullman acting as a go-between to spread the Reich's imperialist message throughout the world. Goebbels then turns his intentions to Tom's map. Unfortunately, it turns out that gazing into the map allows Goebbels to become real enough to shoot Tom, who falls to the ground. It's then that Goebbels demands the doorknob from Savoy and demands a demonstration of its power. However, Goebbels forgot that staring at the projector also made it real, and Lizzie is able to take the general down with just one good swing. Goebbels crumbles to dust, and Tom mysteriously vanishes, leaving only a pile of blood and the bullets behind. It turns out the bullets have not been focused on long enough to become fully tangible, and now Tom is stumbling through the streets of Stuttgart until he encounters a large cloud. Lizzie and Savoy catch up to Tom and inform him that the cloud is in fact Jude Suess. The original story has been corrupted over time by the popularity of the Nazi propaganda film. It's like a canker on a tree, slowly poisoning everything over time. Tom allows Jude Suess to envelop him and he uses the symbol on his hand to begin setting the story right, though not before seeing the face of Wilson Taylor amongst the garble. Everything now back to somewhat normal, Tom uses the doorknob on the map to get everyone back home. The group arrives in London and Savoy notices on a newspaper that they've been gone for three months and something has blown them completely off the front page of the story. So the questions are, what exactly brought Wilson Taylor out of hiding and who it is who wrote the newly announced 14th Tommy Taylor book? We have one last story that acts as an interlude here that takes us to a world analogous to A.A. A. Milne's Hundred Acre Woods and the adventures of Winnie the Pooh and Friends. So in that aspect, I'm just going to refer to the characters to whom they are spoofing and not just these actual character names because they're really dull. Rabbit has been acting bizarre lately. He's calling himself Polly Bruckner and picked up a death wish wanting to throw himself over a cliff at the edge of the woods. However, every time he does so, he's saved by a magical flock of birds. Pooh, Piglet, and the others try to reason with Polly Bruckner, who blames Wilson Taylor for their predicament and them all being in this position. Finally, he storms off to the home of Ms. Liza, the creator, with Pooh and Piglet tailing behind him. Upon reaching the cottage and leaping through a window and Piglet getting stuck behind, Polly confronts Ms. Liza. Liza recognizes that Polly doesn't belong here and throws him into her cellar where several monsters tear him to shreds. Liza assures the others not to worry, there'll be a new rabbit tomorrow. And that concludes the unwritten volume 2, Inside Man. How was it? Well, there's lots of things I do like about this book. I like the addition of Richard Savoy to the character dynamic. He represents this weird kind of everyman character that's even more of an everyman than Tom Taylor, as, of course, he's a literary character possibly come to life. And I think that those dynamics lead to a wonderfully twisted narrative. And the book does a good job of answering questions, which in turn lead to more questions. Like I said, that helps with the narrative a lot, instead of just asking questions all the time. And there's some pretty decent artwork throughout this. If I have one real complaint, uh, again, it's this little interlude that's tacked on to the end. It really doesn't do anything at all. Like, I had a problem with the Kipling story in the previous volume, but at least that did some world building. This does nothing. That, and it's just not very funny. Ooh, it's Winnie the Pooh, but it's filled with swear words. It's just, yeah, really, ugh. Not to mention, I don't think this would be a good jumping on point. I would highly recommend reading Volume 1 before going on to Volume 2, obviously. So with that in mind, I'm going to give the unwritten Volume 2, Inside Man, a B. And with that, let's see what we'll be doing next time on the Random Trade Review.
remember, you can help support my channel at patreon.com forward slash sleepy time for cat productions. There, you can request a trade to be put in the randomizer, aka the cardboard box. Also, remember, like, comment, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell.